Uh, hello and welcome everyone. I'm Swati. Thanks for joining us today for Tea Time with Trees on the World Environment Day. I'm joined today by my colleague Geeta and our speaker for the day, T.S. Srinivas. This talk is being hosted by Season Watch. Season Watch is an India-wide initiative where anyone with an interest in watching trees can join and help us understand how the trees are responding to the changes taking place in our climate. Now, a very warm welcome to you, Srinivas, and a big thanks for speaking to us today. Uh, let's start with a quick introduction for our participants. Srinivas here is a co-founder of EcoEdu, an environment education startup. He is a structural engineer by training, but has been in the field of environmental education for over three decades. Apart from an avid interest in natural history, he has served on many committees involved in biodiversity research and has co-authored many reports for the government on conservation and environmental impact assessments. His passion for natural history has taken him to many tropical forests across the world. Today, he is here to speak about what makes climbing plants unique and which ones you can meet in your own garden. So without more delay, I invite Srinivas over to you now. Thank you, Swati, and uh, good evening to everyone and uh, greetings on the World Environment Day, day when uh, we are all supposed to be out and uh, planting trees or looking at nature. Uh, it is sad that we have to sit in front of the monitors and uh, look at the screen, but uh, hopefully things will improve in the coming days. Without uh, much ado, I also thank Swati for the introduction. And uh, looking at the title, you might be wondering what it is. So we said we'll be talking about climbers, but uh, I'm talking about tension, right? So that's where my professional training comes in. I'm a structural engineer, and uh, I also look at uh, economy in the design of structures. And uh, as my profession took me to different parts of the world, I also visited uh, lots of uh, rainforests and found that uh, Lots of them had uh, lianas and other climbing plants and their diversity was quite high. And uh, I was wondering what made them so unique. And I started uh, reading and I found I was not alone. The first uh, published information by Charles Darwin himself in 1865 on the movements and uh, habits of climbing plants. Okay, he published it as a series of uh, papers in the Linnaean Society Journal and subsequently he wrote a book with his son's uh, sketches in 1875. So in fact it, it seems he spent three years looking at uh, the climbing plants and why they are unique and he even classified them into four different groups based on their climbing habits. So subsequently uh, he was basically looking at how they move, but uh, the scientists have looked at various aspects of their ecology as well as uh, anatomy, and then uh, given us new insights into how they are unique from other groups of plants, even though they belong to the same group. So again, back to the title and then uh, when you look at a climber, you will realize that the whole uh, life of the climber is dependent on being in tension. Because if it is coiled up on the ground, it cannot grow. So the only way it can grow is by extending itself. And to extend itself, it doesn't have a mass of a trunk of a tree. It needs to keep itself in tension. And nature has used this efficiently in many other forms. For example, most of you are familiar with a bat, right? It flies, but uh, it cannot sit upright because the skeleton itself is uh, not designed to take the compressive forces. When, it, when you sit or when you stand, the body weight is being supported on the skeleton and it is being transferred to the ground. But uh, the skeleton of a bat is not designed to take care of those kind of loads. So it hangs upside down. So material is more efficient in tension when compared to compression. So let's start by asking a question. 
Okay. This is how the talk is structured. We'll get an overview of the structure and then of the talk. And then uh, what is a climber? Diversity of climbers and what makes them successful. And we'll also look at the anatomy of climber stem, me mechanics of climbing. And uh, in the end, we'll look at some common climbers. So the question is, what is a climber? Maybe you can take a minute and start typing your answers in the chat box. Okay. So yeah, somebody said plant that takes the support of other structures to grow vertically. Yeah, perfectly all right. So you can define it as a plant with a thin and weak stem that requires support to grow vertically to say. And uh, if you take evolution wise, they are the intermediate forms between weak stemmed herbs and shrubs to the woody stem trees. So then what are lianas? You can see the picture, a vine which grows up with a thick stem finally becomes a lion. Most of you are familiar with uh, the Tarzan stories where he swings from tree to tree using those giant lioness. So there are other forms as well, scandent forms. Okay, we'll uh, take a look at it. And then, uh, so scandent forms are plants which are weak, but uh, even if there is no support, they generally bend, create some tension, and then uh, stay vertical. So the best examples of that would be Alamanda, most of you would have seen Alamanda. So, because of the shrub, uh, if you don't support it, bends over, and then uh, the moment you support it, it will start acting like a climber. Then there are other definitions scramblers. Scramblers are plants which do a little bit of climbing and uh, then they lose their energy. So, they just uh, spread over horizontally, they don't uh, climb vertically. Stragglers, similarly, they hang on to something, but beyond that, they don't do too much of work. So these are stragglers. Then we have ramblers. So ramblers are plants which do some work. For example, rose is a rambler, bougainvillea is a rambler. They do some work, but the work is passive in the sense that they are not actively searching for a support. They have these hooks and thorns, and if they find a support, well and good. Otherwise, they twine on themselves and uh, become more rigid and uh, start playing game. The next group, trailers. Basically, all these refer to plants which grow prostrate on the ground. Generally, they don't have the intent to compete with the larger plants and lose their energy. So they're happy growing on the ground. So for example, most of you could recognize this, this is a bogan villa, and you can see that it is growing as a shrub. There is no support or anything. And all the branches are spreading out and bending. So this is what we call as a scandent form. And uh, over the years, scientists have found that uh, this climbing habit exists in all groups of plants. Okay? That includes the ferns, the pteridophytes, gymnosperms, and angiosperms. And approximately about uh, a third of uh, all the plant families include a few genera of uh, climbing plants and at least one species. And in some of the families, up to 90% of the species are climbing. For example, if you take uh, Passiflorisi, it's got uh, nearly 500 climbers and it's got only about uh, 550 species. So which means that 90% of them are climbers. So I'm putting a few names on the screen. Tabubia aria, okay, the tree of gold. Does anybody recognize this name? Do 
then lantana okay so bohunia galpini alamanda okay hiptej modablata madavilata right so tabubi area when it was originally described from the forests of uh, south america was described as a rambler so even now when you see this plant initially it is it appears so weak that uh, it twists and turns around doesn't grow very tall only if you prevent it from getting enough light then it gets energy and starts growing up but, but otherwise in the rain forest it generally acts as a leaner okay lantana uh, one of the most problematic plants which we have got again the initial uh, people who collected it from the sites in america they have classified them as leaners but i think in india we forgot about it and uh, so if you see the lantana in the open fields generally it's like a shrub but the moment you put it in a forest next to a tree and start using the tree and goes up so many of the forest areas in south india have had, had this problem of lantana getting higher and higher and uh, covering and killing the native vegetation bohunia galpini is another example though, but since it's an ornamental and it, it is not uh, something which is invasive it's okay alamanda same thing hiptage is similar you don't support it it like a shrub but the moment you support it it uh, grows all over in fact in bangalore there are few places where you have the hiptage uh, monocultures running to about 200 feet from the base so you can imagine how big it can go so coming to the individual families fabaceae has nearly 3000 climbing plants apocynaceae more than 1000 convolvulaceae same thing pitaceae the grape family and the gourd family cucurbitaceae all of them have nearly 800 species species passiflorace and uh, aristolochiaceae nearly 500 species of climbing plants dascoriaceae is even higher about 600 or piperaceae the pepper family and uh, when we talk of pepper uh, this is where climbers have been important to humans for a long time in fact they were one of one of the first cultivated plants most of the tubers were obtained from many of these climbing plants and pepper was known as the king of spices and it was valued more than gold once and it even started wars colonies everything so you know the power of a climber bignoniaceae has lots of climbers ranunculaceae the clematis family has lots of climbers malphigiaceae the stigma phylans they are also about 300 species sapindaceae okay pombetraceae all these have climbers and uh, most common genera which you know is uh, bohunia right and uh, you may be surprised to know that uh, bohunia has got 125 species of climbers so the genus bohunia itself has 125 species of climbers so what makes them succeed okay when compared to other plants okay so it's a cost benefit what they do is the minimum investment in vegetative mass they don't have huge trunks which means that they don't have to produce lot of food and cambium and lignin to strengthen the trunk and grow bigger and taller and heavier to support the weight of the leaves above second thing is uh, being flexible as you could see in other groups of plants or animals those which are flexible tend to be successful so here their flexibility comes from the structure of the stem itself and then this is the third important part and that's the most important part as well as for the talk high stem cell strength so for example tests have been conducted to find out what is the tensile strength of the stems of this not in terms of uh, say comparing it with steel or anything but comparing 
with the weight which they have to support. So it was found that even though they had to support a weight of uh, about 10 to 20 grams, okay, they would break only at around 500 to 600 grams. So you, you see the factor of safety there. And of course, this, all this is achieved by modified stem structures. So you need to look inside before you start looking outside the climber to know why it is successful. And apart from that, their leaf area compared to the stem area is quite high, which means that they're able to grow very fast. So Darwin looked at the climbing plants and uh, group them under four different groups, but uh, we'll uh, look at them in a slightly different way, but all the groups which are covered by Darwin will also be covered. So we generally classify them into passive mechanisms and active mechanisms. Passive mechanisms is where you don't do anything physically by yourself, right? That, apart from producing something. So for example, the easiest way is to lean. The picture which you see there is one of the climbers called Petria. Okay. As you can see, it is uh, right now growing as a scandent shrub. You put a trellis or a support next to it, then it will lean onto it and then does nothing beyond that. Okay. Scandent form, if you don't provide a support, they still can survive. Third one is hooks and spines. Okay. These are not uh, produced in response to a stimulus, but maybe for other reasons as to grazing protection and things like that, but they also help in climbing. So for example, uh, Bougainvillea, most of you know, produces spines, but uh, those spines also help in supporting the plant. Scrambling is where you just grow on other plants. Then uh, hooks and spines, we look at slightly more in detail, the simplest form is a prickle. Anybody who has touched a lantana stem know that they have very small prickles on their stem, but surprising to know that it helps them to climb. Okay, thorns, of course, I, I was talking about uh, the bougainvilleas, quisqualis, all this have thorns where they hook onto a support and then help the plant to grow upwards. And anybody who has got caught in the thorns will know that the strength of the thorn is quite high. So, which means that even if, the, if you're going forward and you want to drag yourself, it is almost impossible. So you need to come back and release the hook and then go. So that's the strength of a single hook. Then break out uh, spines. Anybody who has looked at the stem of a rose plant will know that uh, the spines are curved, which makes them more effective. Then arm whips. So this many of you may not have seen, but next time you go to forest or you go to a botanical garden and uh, uh, take a look at uh, some of the cane species, then you take a look at the tip of their leaves and then you'll realize that it's like a arm with. We'll see the pictures in the end. Then the active mechanisms, most common, all of us are familiar, is the twining mechanism where it goes around a support, clasping, hold on to a support, tendrils, right? Again, anybody who has seen a gout plant or some of the passifloras or bignonia species would be familiar with the tendrils. Some of them even use adhesive pads and roots. So these are all active mechanisms, which means that the plant is growing them to get support. Whereas in the passive methods, it's just a byproduct. Then you have the weavers, which means that uh, they get strength by either weaving around their own stems or around supports. Okay. Then you have the graspers and that the stickers. Okay. These include uh, tendrils with hooks, twiners, hold on to some support by tension, clingers which have tendrilate, which have tendrils in the end, and then 
hooks which are modified specifically for climbing then you have the rooters anybody who has seen a ficus growing on a wall ficus pumila okay is a divy these produce roots which get into the cracks and crevices in the walls and help the plant to grow up so before looking at the exterior modifications let us look at some of the anatomical modifications variable stiffness okay during various stages of growth what does this mean which means that uh, when the plant starts as a seedling initially for about uh, half a meter of its growth it needs to be quite stiff because uh, it needs to grow vertically otherwise it will go prostrate and lose direction so in those times the stem is rigid but the moment it reaches a certain height then the new growth from the stem with the apical bud becomes very flexible which means that it can swing around to look for the support again once it finds a support only the tip is still flexible but the bottom parts start becoming rigid you might have seen some of the old climbers with uh, woody bases where the flexibility of the base is no longer required it's only the tip of the growing branch that needs to be flexible so how good it would have been? even uh, human babies have flexible bodies when they are young but it becomes rigid but after that it becomes very difficult for you to go back to the flexible lifestyle whereas climbers manage to do that and varying material stiffness so what is material stiffness most of you would have seen wood steel and concrete plastic right so steel it's very elastic and wood is brittle concrete is even more brittle so you try to pull it the concrete fractures quite easily the steel takes a very long time and then yields rather than breaking so the plants also particularly the climbing plants use this to their advantage how do they do it by producing tissues of different density so that the stiffness of the stem is varied during different parts of the growth and then of course another way to increase stiffness is to make it bigger for example a very small pipe has got less stiffness but you make it bigger and it's difficult to bend it or it, it is difficult to buckle it so increase the size so that's what they are doing at the base where the stem sizes increase or they also develop appendages which give them additional strength so this is by changing the geometry or by changing the material stiffness okay and then one more important thing is the hydraulic functionality what is hydraulic functionality it is to make sure that water from the roots is transported till the tip of the growing branch onto all the leaves so as i told you some of them are up to 200 meters in fact uh, one of the climbing cane family plants from the us was measured to be about 3000 feet from the base which is almost a kilometer and is still growing so you can imagine how efficient the transport mechanism should be generally the height of the tree is limited by the hydraulic functionality but here you can see that it is not a limitation in terms of growth so how do they manage it they have two layers the inner layer with thick walled fibers and then narrow fibers in the sarcher shoe so which means that in the initial part of the growth will go to the sarcher shoe they don't require very big vessels but once they start growing they develop very big vessels okay and then uh, xylem is the main conduit for water so they have larger xylem lens and diameters and when i talk of uh, diameters it is in terms of few micro millimeters so not when compared to corresponding trees they are quite higher quite high sorry and then large vessels 
will be able to transport large quantities of uh, water. So that means even though the stem is small, the conductivity is high. And then most important part is the xylem lifespan itself. So most of the trees, what happens is the xylem has an annual lifespan. Generally, it gets clogged. They are not narrow and then they die after a year or they are abandoned by the tree and then new growth takes place every year. Whereas in climbers, in many of the species, the same xylem which started when the plant took birth will stay till they die, which means that they can stay up to 50, 60, 70 years depending on the life of the climber. And there's one more terminology called embolism, which means that uh, any narrow pipe uh, carrying a fluid generally has a problem with entrapped air. So if the air is entrapped, then uh, the passage is blocked. So if the passage is blocked, then the vessel is as good as useless. So, but climbers have managed to make sure that uh, the embolism is reduced. And then also they have better repair mechanisms means that if there is any damage to the xylem, they have special secretions which immediately cover it up and uh, so that will also retain the flexibility. So here you look at a typical cross section of a tree, right? You can see where the xylem and the phloem is. And this is the dead wood in the center where the old xylem is there. So, but compare it with that of a climber. You can see see the size of the vessels okay, and see where the phloem is and see how far they are spaced. This is a growing shoot which means that uh, most of the xylem is concentrated at the center. So any damage due to bending is ex at, uh, higher at the extreme tip so the bundles in the center are protected. So as I told you uh, I also designed structures and we installed some structures in very deep waters. So where oil needs to be lifted from that depth as well as you need to inject chemicals and also electrical cables to go to the depth. So if I show you the cross section of uh, the umbilicals which are used to do that, you'll be able to appreciate what I'm saying. So you can see these are the umbilicals which uh, transfer electrical signals and also fluids to the structures which are about uh, 3000 meters below sea level. So you see the structure and you'll be able to appreciate how they look similar. So climbers had thought about it much earlier than we designed it. And again, a cross section of uh, some of the climbing species and also the electron microscope with the die, so you can see where the Xylem is. This is Neetum. Okay, this is uh, one of the Bohunias. You can see the groups of uh, xylems here. So this is also an example of modifying the geometry to get uh, better stiffness. Okay. This is from one of the Ipomias and Aristolochias. You can see the vessels here. These are called rays and you can see how they are organized so that uh, the damage is minimized. This is one of the hypomias again. And you can see that the central part is hollow. Then there are, so this is what makes them tough from inside and then uh, what makes them survive is the biomechanics. So a few definitions, uh, up heliotropism is the tendency to grow away from the sunlight. Scototropism is opposite of uh, phototropism. Phototropism is the tendency of plants to grow towards light, but scototropism is the tendency of them to grow away from light. So Darwin found out that uh, instead of uh, the young shoots or the climbing tips, they would never grow towards light, but they would grow towards darkness. Then he re realized that uh, they are sensing that 
if there is darkness, then there must be some support there. So they are moving towards the support rather than towards the light. Then gravitotropism is the tendency of the plant to oppose the force of gravity and grow upwards. Then we have what are called as searcher shoots. These are uh, very important. So when the we'll look at a picture and then I'll uh, explain. Then internode spacing. Node spacing is the distance between leaf to leaf, and uh, initially in the growing phase, the internode spacing is quite high. We'll also see a picture. And then the most important definition is circummutation. So this term was uh, coined by Charles Darwin himself to describe the movement of the plants. So what he found, in fact, he spent several sleepless nights watching the behavior. He would take a glass plate put it on the, above the growing tip and then mark the positions with paint mark on the glass as well as paint on the stem itself to see how much it has grown. And then he plotted them and found out that they have a tendency to move in one direction and then suddenly after about two to 24 hours, depending on the species, abruptly change the direction and start growing towards the other direction. So this they would repeat till they found a support or depending on the age and the height of the plant, if it had multiple shoots, then if one of the shoots did not find a support after some time, then they would stop nutrition supply to that particular growing tip and then continue growing in the other direction. As you can see here, uh, the finding on the circummutation also depends on several parameters. One is the stem diameter. It's very important uh, because uh, particularly to plants, climbing plants to generate a certain amount of tension, the diameter of the support is quite important. So based on the studies, it is found that uh, the maximum diameter with around which the climbers can twine is about a foot. That's about 30 centimeters. Beyond that, generally, they won't be able to twine. There are other plants which survive by growing straight up. We'll show a few pictures, but uh, they can't twine around physically because they can't generate enough tension to fall down to such a large diameter. And then the other one is called as the angle of ascent. As you can see, if I draw a horizontal line here, and this is the angle, so this is the angle of ascent. So that is again driven by the diameter of the stem. If the diameter is small, then the angle of ascent will be higher. But if it is bigger, then it will be almost circular, like a helix rather than a big angle here, as you can see here. Of course, the most important part is the tension. And uh, how do they do that? Initially, they coil around the support, and then only the top two or three coils generate enough tension to hold anything below. What Darwin and others found was that uh, initially they would have multiple coils, but once the growing tip started moving and started climbing up, only the top two or three coils would hold onto the support, and the rest of them would drop down. And they wondered why, but then they found out that by dropping down, they're increasing the tension in the stem, which means that the holding is much tighter. Again, you can try it at home. You can take a pipe and take a rope, it on that, and then hold only on the top and you leave it. You can see that the bottom of the rope is vertical, which is in tension. Friction is another important aspect, very smooth. Surfaces may not be able to give enough grip to hold the plant. So rough surfaces are better. And then the helix. The shape of the helix is quite important because uh, they found that uh, they generally don't prefer supports which are square, rectangular, but they would generally go to anything circular. We'll look at the figure and then see what is this normal force. 
Okay, as you can see here, this is the ascent angle, this is the radius of curvature and support pole radius. Uh, if there is a video, I'll just see, uh, show you how it goes around. And you can also see the force exerted by the growing stem on the support is plotted there. It is in millinewtons, so that is uh, one hundredth of a newton. Ten newtons is one kg, so you can do the maths. As you can see, the with increase in time, the hold on the support is becoming tighter. Then the stems have flexibility, which is quite important because uh, as I told you, if, it, if the support is lost, then everything falls down as a coil rather than a broken branch or a broken tree, which is difficult for the tree or plant to generate, uh, regenerate. Whereas a coil falling down, the plant will, um, the climber will again put up its twining stems and get another support. Okay. Large internode spacing, I told you what it is. So lack of leaves is another important thing because uh, the climber is not very sure whether the shoot is going to find a support. And if it doesn't find a support, there's no point in putting too much of energy by putting new leaves there. So generally it avoids putting leaves in the growing shoot till it finds a support. And tightly packed xylem as we saw there in the initial illustration. So the growing tips are again elastic and uh, very flexible. There's one more video which, was, which I was telling you. You can see that uh, a flexible wire is being wrapped around a pole. Yeah, and, and something important, you see that uh, by pulling there, you are increasing the tension. Okay, but. The moment you release the tension on the top, it falls down as a coil, as I told you. So the damage is relatively less when it falls down as a coil than compared to a breaking of a branch. So twining stems have circummutation, which is the movement in different directions. Initially, the motions are circular, but uh, it takes about two to 24 hours for each sweep. And then once the sensor support they discriminatory in the sense that they won't take all the supports, they will see whether it is suitable. And then, then only they will, though they may touch the support several times, they'll only accept it. I don't know where the decision is being made, but once it is acceptable to their liking. Initially they twine, okay? and then they form a helix. And the helix itself, has got a bending force, a normal force, which is the tension. And then there's also a torsion because it is growing up. So all these are very important because a circular structure is a perfect in managing also. So that's why the tendrils generally are circular. More video, which shows, even if, as I told you, even though it does a support, generally it will not uh, take the support immediately. It will touch it several times. And you can also see the circumlutation change in direction. Then once it grows around a support, then it will put a stipule or a leaf in between the support and itself so that the tension is increased, as you can see in this video. This, the leaf is growing here, and you can see this is the stipule. So So this is in about 70 hours after the initial tightening. So you see that they're actively working. Okay, so, so the 
twining stems, how they hold on to supports. Then we come to tendrils. So again, plants may use different techniques during different uh, periods of their growth. Sometimes they may be Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, you're audible. Okay. Tendrils are specialized vegetative organs. So the plants use different techniques during different periods of growth. They may just twine, they may just lean, they may use thorns, they may use passive or active mechanisms, and they switch over between each of these depending on what they sense. So whether the support is not enough, if the support is enough, then they may start mining. If the support is enough, then they're okay with just leaning. And then there are specialized structures which are developed called tendrils, as you can see in here also. They are derived from either leaves, branches, inflorescences, leaflets, stipules, or even the petioles of the leaves themselves. So tendrils come from different parts of the plant. They generally start as uh, straight or slightly arched thin growths. Okay. And uh, another interesting thing is they also circumnutate sometimes in uh, conjunction with the uh, primary growing group, but sometimes in opposition to that as well. But finally, once it finds a support, it will make sure that there is equilibrium. And uh, compared to the growing tips of the branches, the tendrils have very irritable tips, which means that even a slight touch will make them sense that there is support and they'll immediately start coiling. So next time you see a climbing plant and you see a tendril which is not uh, onto any support, you just touch it and uh, you go after some time, you'll also see that it has already started coiling, which means that you have folded it to think that there is a support. And then once it finds an obstruction, it tries to grow around the obstruction and the obstructions can be very thin. Sometimes even a spider web strand will fold it to think that there is a support there and it will try to grow around it. You can see different parts of the tendril. These are the initial growths where it is just as a straight long thread. This one has found a support, so then it has coiled like a spring. And this one at the bottom did not find any support. So the plant uh, stopped sending any more nutrients. So this one just curls and dies after some time. And here, this is Gloriosa superba, and you'll see that uh, here the leaf itself is modified as a tendril. So they can wrap around very thin objects. What is the upper length uh, of the diameter? around which they can go is slightly better. So longer tendrils can go around bigger supports, smaller ones around smaller supports. But they, unlike a growing shoot where only two rounds are enough here, they require several rounds of coiling to get enough grip and they help to pull the plant close to the support. And that pulling may be in the range of about uh, six centimeters to 10 centimeters, depending on the weight of the climber. So again, the efficiency depends on the first tension, how much tension it can hold so that it can generate enough friction and bending. Bending is another important thing because uh, most of you would have got a cloth line at home and you have an experience that you hang something on it, it will sag, but you tie it very tightly and then hang something on it, then the bending is less or the sag is less. So tension again, contributes to reduction in bending. So tendrils have that mechanism of increasing tension to reduce bending. Okay, and then there's one more important thing which we'll see in the next uh, slide, but uh, imagine that uh, you're holding a thread in one end and uh, twisting it from the other end. After some time when it, the twisting point comes near your finger, unless your finger twists, you can't do anything more. So imagine a tendril which is attached to the stem and on a support trying to coil, but as it comes near the support, then the support itself also will have to coil, which means that either the support will have to twist 
or the tendril will have to break. So they have found a very unique way of avoiding that. Okay. And then they also have uh, different ends to adapt to different climbing circumstances. As you can see here, these are what we call as uh, regular tendrils on branch. As you can here you can see from the cat's claw climber, it has got three hooks. This is called as a trifid tendril. This is unbranched. So they are, once they get a support, they're very stiff at the attachment and elastic in the coiled area. And the growth again does not require new cell growth at the tip, but the cells which are there expand. So this is another adaptation. Plus it also helps in providing flexibility to win because uh, when you're attached to a support, the support is rigid and does not move, whereas the climber is very slender and it is pushed around by the wind. So if the tendril is not like a shock absorber, then the support may easily break. So they act as shock absorbers as well. So there are lots of uh, adaptations. You can see that the gelatinous fibers are concentrated at uh, different parts where the support is. Here you can see it is at one side only. Here it is all round. Here it is thicker. Okay. So this is what I was telling you. You can see that uh, it is twining in one direction here. And then around suddenly around this point, it changes the direction of coiling and goes to the other direction. So this is what prevents the support or the main plant from twisting around itself. And this point in the center. This is called as the area of perversion or the line of perversion where the opposite coiling happens. And we can also see in most of the times that uh, the number of coils on this side will be equal to number of coils on the other side. So next time you look at a climber, just uh, don't walk off, look at all these things. So some of the examples of uh, the climbing, uh, passive climbing mechanisms, which we discussed. So you can, here you can see, most of you remember this. This is a lantana stem with the prickle. This is euphorbia mill, which has got thorns. Paris has also got thorns. Rose. Then these are the canes. As you can see, the tip of the leaves are modified into whips. So when there is a wind, it just twist around and if it gets a support it hooks onto it and then the cane will grow around it plus it has also got sharp thorns on the stems themselves so they are able to hang on to anything this is the tip of a leaf of the cane so you can see that uh, there's a lot of hooks and uh, all are recurved and they're very easily attached and they can hold a lot of weight this was the plant I was talking about, which was measured to about uh, 3,000 feet, almost a kilometer. So this is called Desmonacus, which is a climbing species from the Americas. And you can see it has got hooks which are pointing backwards. This is Manorangini. You can see that uh, the inflorescence plus the fruit petiole, I mean the fruit uh, stem gets into a hook. find for themselves and become stronger. And then this, these are some unique adaptations. As, as I told you, if the diameter becomes too big, then they're not able to grow. So particularly the twining plants have a problem, but those with uh, tendrils don't have a problem because then they'll put the tendrils in the cracks and nooks of this bar and then climb up so they can go up to 100 200 feet even on very big trees then there are root climbers this is the hedera most of you are familiar with then monstera again is a root climber so so you know that uh, tension plays a very important role in the growing of the plant and making sure that uh, it retains its vertical growing habit. So that was the title of the talk itself. So intention. So the intent is to keep the plant alive. So far, contention. 
Okay. Any questions now before we go to the? Uh, yeah. So um, please ask your questions in the chat box. There are a few questions uh, that we had for you. So I can uh, ask the questions and then you can respond uh, to each question. Shall we do that? Sure, no problem. I can't okay. see the chat box, but then, uh, okay. So I will. Uh, I'll. I'll ask the questions. That's fine. Uh, so the uh, okay. So the first question is. I mean, uh, uh, from Season Watch only. <laughs> so woody yeah. climbers like Antada look very snaky. Uh, does yeah. secondary growth occur in a particular fashion to support such structures? Yes, of course. They have uh, secondary growths only along the edges, not in the mm -hmm. center. So plus, uh, the there are what are called as uh, plated structures inside, so that they have this structure. So it is some uh, some of the uh, leguminosae climbers exhibit this, even bahunias exhibit this feature. In fact, if you go to some of the parts of the world, the climbers are called monkey ladders because they have shapes which are like ladders. So flat and okay. with steps. Okay. Okay. Um, so the second question is, uh, do climbers have a preferred host? This is my question. Do climbers have a preferred host for climbing depending on their climbing mechanism? If they do, how do they tend to be closer to this host? Okay, so only way they can, um, they, they don't have a choice because the dispersion is not dependent on them. They can only produce seeds and where, unless their root suckers go and grow next to a plant. But uh, recent research shows that they are very discriminatory when they find their support. So the, which means that they avoid some of the weak stem plants. So this is what I call in the COVID, uh, this one is uh, social distancing because they make sure that they don't climb on very weak stem plants. They know that they can't survive. So they keep moving till they find a, a better support. Okay. I had a follow up on that, uh, uh, which is uh, how do they get dispersed? How are most climber species uh, getting dispersed? Is there any preferred uh, uh, dispersal mechanism? No, since they belong to almost all the major groups of plants, they are either by water. Entera, for example, is by water. So, mm. uh, wind. Many of the Malphigiaceae climbers have uh, uh, wings with which they get dispersed by air. Then many of them have berries which are dispersed by birds and mammals. So it's not that uh, there's a specific mechanism. I repeat that question. Are strangler figs also considered climbers? Uh, no, they are called uh, hemiapiphytes or some. So many of the other species also, like orchids, are also like that. Right? So they start growing from the top to the bottom. Mm -hmm. Whereas the climber, we say that it starts from ground up, not top down. Okay, yeah. Also, the the climbers are uh, dependent for support only, right? Not yeah, for yeah. nutrition yeah. on the no, yeah no. yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question is, is tactile uh, response in climbers similar to other types of plant movement, like leaf folding response in touch me not? Mm, no, generally not uh, very, uh, because those are uh, defensive mechanisms, whereas here it is an active mechanism to find a support. So it's slightly different. Okay. Uh, the next question is uh, from Kartika. Is climbing characteristics have any importance in taxonomy? Mm, no, not uh, really. Because again, as I told you, different uh, characters are used by the same group of plants during different stages of growth. For example, uh, I have this favorite uh, instance of a uh, climber in Lalbagh, which is uh, in Bangalore. So we were looking at a climber and were trying to identify it. It belongs to the Bignonia C group and uh, initially it didn't have any tendrils. So we knew it was a Bignonia C, but uh, uh, from the leaf and flower it was difficult to identify. So then uh, 
after some time, we noticed that the tendrils came out, but they were not branched. Okay. We'll uh, quickly run through the common climbers. I yes. selected uh, 25 species of uh, native climbers so that it okay. is easy for everyone to. Okay, great. Yeah, there were some comments regarding this. People want to see that. So yeah, let's do that. Thank you. Can you see the screen now? Yes. Uh, we can see the screen, but it's not in presentation. Oh, yeah. Now that's now we can see. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So India is uh, blessed with lots of climbers, uh, particularly the Northeast and uh, the Western Ghats area. But uh, you don't see them often in uh, cultivation. Plus, uh, they're also not available from the nurseries for people to grow. So here is a list of. Uh, the common climbers which are usually found in the nurseries as well as uh, uh, these are native. We don't generally make a distinction between uh, native and non-native, but uh, if people have preferences, uh, you can always plant them, no problem. So this will start with the, uh, and the presentation is organized based on the flower color, Vibgayar. So it starts from violet and uh, goes down to red. And uh, okay, so. so this is one of those uh, common climbers where the flowers uh, open in the morning and then uh, fade by and fall by evening. So this, that's why it is called as the morning glory. Quite common. You also get uh, several variants of this uh, Ipomia tricolor, Ipomia nil. Okay, the next one is the elephant ear wine. This one is uh, quite a huge one, Ar Argeria nervosa. As one more called Argeria cuneata as well. And these uh, require big arches to support them. The leaves are also very attractive and uh, they attract a lot of uh, insects when they are in bloom. So this one is uh, called as the elephant ear vine. The railroad creeper, most of you would have seen it when going by train or along the fences because uh, it was uh, used as a cover along the railway quarters earlier, but it spread everywhere. So this is the Ipomia carica. Shankapushpi, Lutria ternatia. Okay. You get both the varieties, the blue one as well as the white one. Sometimes both colors in the same plant. The clock wine, which is uh, quite famous. This is the Bengal clock wine, Grandiflora. And uh, generally it keeps flowering through the year but uh, you need to manage it because uh, it can grow into a very big climber. Another related species, this is the Laurifolia. The flowers look similar, but the leaf shape is different. We'll... This is the Monorangini or the climbing yellow lung. Uh, very fragrant. So if you're looking for a plant to put some fragrance in the garden, uh, this can be one of them. This is called as a Tonkin jasmine, uh, Telosma caldata, one of the very fragrant creepers which you can get. In fact, the generic name Telosma means, Osma means fragrance, Telo means from a distance. So Telosma, the name itself says that it has got a very good fragrance. Caldata because the leaves are heart shaped. This is one of the most beautiful climbers uh, and uh, ranked as one of the most beautiful in the world as well. This is the Mysore trumpet wine, Thunbergia mysurensis. Uh, propagation is mainly by cuttings because uh, they don't set uh, fruit in uh, the gardens because the pollinator is missing. Gloriosa superba, you can get it from few nurseries and uh, it doesn't take too much of space. The curtain climber is one of those uh, climbers which is uh, very good for covering all the unwanted uh, parts of the garden. If you have pipes or any of open areas which you want to screen, this can be used. It's a beautiful climber as well in terms of flowers, as you can see from here. Frangipani wine is the lihana. It grows into a very huge climber. So 
not recommended for small gardens but if you have a big garden then welcome it's also got a very nice smell so fragrant climber this is the malati or the cloud scented echitis uh, uh, aganos mahini it blooms in the evening and uh, the scent is just amazing and this plant has been popular in india for a long time so <clears throat> it's also called as lavangalata so you can find it even mentioned in uh, jayadeva sastapadis as well where he says lalita lavangalata parishilana so this is the lavangalata clematis many varieties are available uh, they keep uh, flowering through the year very nice smell doesn't take too much space so if you have a arch or a trellis in the garden these are recommended plants if you want some vegetables coccinia grandis okay. wax flower is one of those small climbers which you can grow even in your balcony it's the a root climber basically you put a support it goes around but if you have a wall it will just put uh, sticky pads on them and then climb and the flowers small but amazing fragrance jasmine we are all familiar many varieties in fact uh, uh, the earlier flora of india recorded about uh, 25 species of jasmine uh, but nowadays we don't see too many of them commonly though it is this one is called as a fragrance it doesn't have fragrance but still can grow in very small spaces in your balcony or in your window sill so i would recommend anybody who has a small space to plant this flowers through the year this one is the bengal clock vine variant the the earlier blue one this one is a white flowered variety again grows into a very huge climber if you don't manage if you prune it every year then it's okay this is the star jasmine very fragrant again they can be grown in a small garden as well as a large garden as long as you prune it it can maintain its shape otherwise it will go out of control this is called as a bread flower valaris very sweet smelling flowers very nice again you can grow it as a small shrub or put it on your compound or it can become a huge plant so depends on how you use it but again recommended if you are looking for some fragrant flowers in your garden this is the rangoon creeper combretum uh, this one is uh, the earlier name was more apt earlier it was called quisqualis uh, which means who what because the the plant you never know it looks uh, something different when it is young and once it starts flowering it's completely different and it starts spreading everywhere so and this is one of those climbers which uh, uses uh, thorns to hold on so the petioles themselves get modified into uh, thorns so very fragrant flowers plus you also get some of the double flower varieties in some of the nurseries the number of flowers are quite huge very fragrant and then this is the scarlet tumbergia no fragrance but uh, very beautiful uh, flowers which uh, hang down from a trellis or an arch and uh, adds color to the garden for a few months in a year so again recommended for anybody who's got Yes. then uh, these are the native climbers about 25 species okay so any questions because we have already short past 1 uh, hour 15 minutes so i thought uh, i'll stop it here yeah thanks for that thanks so much for that so uh, we we have only one uh, question now from vishesh um, he asks do nurseries sell um, these climbers and how to grow them yeah nurseries uh, sell most of the climbers which have uh, listed here they're come how to grow them well 
uh, most of them require except for the hoyas and uh, which are very dependent on uh, the shade but uh, other plants grow very well in the sun so just need some space and uh, make sure that you manage the climber that's it they don't require too much of attention okay there's uh, one more question that just came in uh, by swedel uh, the question is why thunbergia is are called clock vines is it on their twining pattern yes sir can okay, this is one of the points which i missed so thanks for asking the question yes they twine in the clockwise direction that's why they are called clock vines but uh, the some of the research has shown that about 90% of the species uh, turn anti clockwise or a right hand helix so okay uh thank you so much rinivas for that uh, wonderful talk and also um, coming back and showing us uh, uh, introducing us to some native uh, climbers uh, from india that was really really wonderful to see such beautiful flowers uh and um, i i'm sure it was useful for our listeners so thank you again for um, uh, coming and talking to us in tea time for trees on world environment day uh and thank you all to uh, thank you all uh, our participants for uh, joining and listening to us today thank you have a nice evening yes thank you bye everyone